I think a good place to start when we talk about club is the general business model for club. And if Matt, if you'll hit the next uh, slide there. Um, so the basic financial model behind club is that all of their profit is supposed to come from membership income. That was the way it was started. That was the, the, the idea. And that the merchandise sales, the profit that comes from merchandise sales would just cover operating expenses, uh, labor, you know, overhead, everything like that. So over time, what you've seen is Costco has been really good about staying on that model. Uh, Costco makes the, um, pretty much nothing on their merchandise sales after, after expenses. Uh, but And over time, what you've seen is that with Costco is that um, their membership income has continued to increase. Now, Sam's hasn't been as good about staying on that model. You'll see time, we've seen times over the past years that Sam starts making too much on merchandise and actually making you know significant profit off merchandise. But what happens is the inverse happens is that the um, the membership income declines during those time periods. So Sam's has been better about that lately. But that's just the basic financial model of club: make your profit off of your membership income. Next slide. And um, here we just thought through. What are the essentials for a club item? Whether it's an item you're trying to get into club or an item that you've already got in club and you want to succeed. Uh, these are kind of the, the must-haves for club and they apply to everyone. They apply to PNG and they apply to the smallest supplier. Uh, value, that's the biggest one, the most important one, and we'll talk more about that. You know, having a club pack that's right and a pallet configuration that's right and packaging that's right. Quality for club is really important. Uh, productivity, uh, you don't have a lot of SKUs, so you, they've all got to be productive. Availability and support. All right, Matt, next slide. So value is the biggest member reason members join the club, and it's also the biggest uh, reason members leave the club. If you think of yourself as like a consumer, if you did the math on a club item and you found you were only saving 2% or 3% or 4%, you'd probably be pretty disappointed. Um, uh, every retailer wants to have a value, but the difference in club is in club, you pay to join. You pay to be a member. So you expect to save a significant amount of money. Um, usually in club, that the, kind of the, the low water mark on that is 20, 25%. Um, it varies by category and it'll even vary by subcategory, but know that members want to save a significant amount of money. Um, retail value, they usually compare to club competitors. If you look at Sam's and Costco, they're usually okay with being at parity versus one another. Uh, the other p uh, uh, retailer that they compare to traditionally is Walmart. So Walmart's usually got the best price in the market outside of clubs, so that's the one that club compares to a lot as well. Um, one thing to remember here too, especially when you're dealing with Sam's Club, is Sam's Club tend to look at cost on the Walmart side. So um, I've seen uh, suppliers get hung up on that where they yeah. where they uh, aren't giving uh, Sam's Club a good cost, right? And so they, uh, they can Sam's Club can check on that versus Walmart. Um, value is derived both from the lower margin structure of club and a supplier cost slope. So I've heard a lot of suppliers say, hey, naturally I will be a value at club because club takes a lower margin. The truth of that is that that's partially true, but you also have to have a supplier cost slope. When that is usually when you look at a cost per ounce basis, a cost per each basis, uh, the bigger pack size, the club pack size will have a lower cost, uh, have a cost slope. And especially when you get into a lot of areas and, uh, like electronics and things like that, there are creative ways to provide value uh, other than just price or cost. Um, you'll see a lot of things in like TVs that you get a special remote at club or something added more so than just a, you know, price to price comparison versus mass. Uh, any questions there? Okay. Next slide, Matt. Uh, this is just a value example in the way that uh, Sam's Club buyers uh, calculate value um, or Costco or BJ's. Uh, what is it at the comparison retailer, which in a lot of cases is Walmart. You can see here Oreos. 
or uh, 53 and a half cents per six pack at Sam's Club. We just tried to scrap this as an example. It's 39 cents. So the 53 cents minus the 39 divided by the 53 cents. And in this case, you could say that Sam's Club is a 25% value versus Walmart. Any questions? Okay. So the next piece, you have to have a club pack, right? Generally, that means that it's going to be something, a larger pack size than food, drug, and mass. And there's a couple of reasons behind that. By having a uh, larger pack size than you have in mass, grocery, or whatever, it, it, gives you, um, it gives you a reason to be able to give club a, a slope, a cost slope. So that helps to get to the value. And then part of the reason you need a larger pack size too is perceived value. Um, if you have the same pack size sitting out there in mass or grocery, Lots of times it's, it, it confuses members, right? It's easy as a member to look at that and say, hey, that's the biggest pack size I've seen anywhere. That's a lot bigger than what I see at Walmart or I see at Kroger. It must be a good value. So part of the, the reason to have a larger pack size is just to get you to the cost slope. And then and there's also the perceived value of that large pack size. Um, one thing to keep in mind is club packs found outside of the club channel cease to be club packs, right? You can very easily get caught on a carpet by a buyer if they find a club pack outside of the club channel. Um, I've seen a, in my buying days at Sam's Club, I found, saw a lot of instances where items were deleted because suppliers let that club pack leak outside of the club channel. So be really careful with that. You really need a, cl a strong club channel strategy um, and, and basically something that's written and has some teeth to it, right? Is that you that these packs are confined to the club channel. Uh, one way I've seen suppliers get to make this work is part of their rules is this this is only can be sold where it can be merchandised in a, in a pallet format uh, to help people get around that sometimes too. Um, as far as club packs, back in the old days, you used to see a lot of just clear shrink wrap or two packs strapped together. It's become a lot more sophisticated than that lately. There's a lot of ways to execute, and I've got some examples there on the next page. Um, one of the, oh, I'm sorry, Matt, that wasn't really it. The, um, and then there's the concept of bulk penalty. Uh, Charles Redfield, when he was the chief merchant of Sam's, talked about this a lot. Um, if you're going to buy a larger packet club, you have a big value expectation. And when you look at that gap, the club pack versus, say, a mass pack, if the club pack is a lot larger, say in mass, it's a single unit and club, it's a six pack. Well, you're asking the member to buy something that's significantly larger than what they find in mass. And it means that you're going to have to have even a greater value, right? So those kind of things are kind of tied together. And when we think about your club pack size, be sure to consider your consumption rates and your shelf life, right? You don't want to you don't want to have product that going out of date at club, right? It, uh, or going out of date in people's homes. So usually they they use a measurement of can a family of four consume it within a couple of weeks. Um, so look at the consumption rates, look at the shelf life when you think about your pack size. All right, next slide. Here are just some examples. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to build a club pack, right? Bags in a box is really popular. Saddle bags, you see that on a lot of products and a lot of things like bagged shredded cheese, things like that. Uh, just having a larger bottle. Um, a lot of suppliers use clamshells a lot. Uh, dog bone is really popular, especially when you get in items that are in bottles. And then uh, a shrink wrap, we talked about or in the early days of club, you saw a lot of clear shrink wrap. These days, you see a lot more graphic shrink, and it really makes a nice-looking presentation uh, as far as graphic shrink. Any questions there? Okay. You've also got to have a good palette. And what club is looking for is what they call door-to-floor efficiency, that they can bring it in the back door, roll it out, put it on the floor with very little labor or effort. Um, you used to see a lot of things in the club channel around pallet skirts, corner cards, and those have kind of gone away to, for the most part lately. Um, the reason behind that was is it's it's just a lot of it's a lot of waste and it's a lot of labor to throw them away. Um, the only place that you still kind of see the pallet skirts being used 
is over in electronics. You'll see it a lot. Or in situations where something really has to be explained to the member. Um, so you see it in a lot of electronics. Um, they look for you on your pallets to have very little underhang so that there's not a lot of wood showing on the pallet. And then no overhang because it gets hung up on things and causes problems. Um, one thing that, that is always good is to keep your pallet dimensions in mind as you're designing your product. What I mean is, in a lot of cases, suppliers will build their individual selling unit, and it'll be whatever size it ends up being. And then the next step is, okay, how do we fit this on a pallet? And lots of times, based on those pack sizes, it doesn't really work for a 48 by 40 pallet. Um, so if you begin with your pallet dimensions in mind, and you know I've got 48 by 40 pallet dimensions, Sometimes that can affect your dimensions on in your in your individual units where you've got uh, where you've got a little bit of latitude there, and you can you, you start with your pallet dimensions in mind and almost build backwards into your pack uh, pack uh, box sizes. Structural integrity is really important. Um, as a buyer, we used to get in a lot of meetings where it was kind of the wall of shame kind of thing, and they would put up pictures of pallets that buyers had bought that were sagging, that were falling apart. Um, that's and that's never a call you want to get from your buyer is when that's happened. Um, think a lot about how many units you put on your pallet. Pallets really shouldn't exceed over about three or four weeks of inventory in most cases, because if you can get if if there's more than that on a pallet, it it negatively negatively affects the buyer's terms. Um, sometimes that was a little bit of a, uh, trying to weigh two things as a buyer, right? If you get a lot on a pallet, it probably was going to help your end stocks. But it would negatively affect your turns, and turns are really a big, a big uh, measuring stick for buyers. Uh, merchandising, forty-eight versus forty inches. Traditionally, Costco merchandises on the forty-eight inch side of the pallet. Sam's Club merchandises on the forty-inch side of the pallet, primarily in the run. So um, make sure when you design your pallets, especially if you're trying to get them into multiple club retailers, that there are that they look good on the 48 inch side and they look good on the 40 uh, inch side as well. Um, one thing to keep in mind on this too is a lot of times, say if you're selling something into Sam's and your 40 inch side looks really good, it's very shoppable. Sometimes Sam's Club, you may have an opportunity to put that on the end cap. Well, if it's on an end cap, the 40 inch side and the 40 inch side are going to be sh uh, showing. So you want to make sure that your pallets are shoppable from at least three to four sides, right? That they look good and they are shoppable from the, that many sides. Any questions? Just, uh, just a quick reminder for anyone who joined, we've got a good number with us now, but if you joined late, anyone that has questions for Ben, just click on that Q and A button in, uh, in zoom. You, you can see that he is pausing after each slide. So if you've got questions, in fact, one just popped up. Um, it says, how are category and department allocations, the number of SKUs or space, how is that determined internally? Is this decision taken annually or more often? It seems to me that soft lines are over allocated. Thank you for that question. That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, uh, Sam's Club has a space team that draws up the, the planograms for each club. And a lot of it's based on history. But as clubs are redesigned or clubs are uh, reviewed, uh, the DMMs and sometimes the GMMs can have input on those clubs to try to shift that space. As a buyer, you receive, uh, for each club, you have a space allocation. So say if you're buying laundry and cleaning, which was one of the categories I used to buy, you know, in this club, I've got 26 pallet positions. Here's where they sit in the club. And when you do your assortment work, you know, I'm starting with 26 pallet positions. Um, and the next piece of that would be, okay, well, I've got 28 active items in this club. So I know as I do my assortment work, I've got to cut at least two, right? But uh, usually it's a, it's, it comes to you as allocation from the space team. Um, sometimes buyers can push back on that, but if you're going to gain space, it means that somebody else is going to have to lose space and they're not usually very happy about that. I, any follow-up questions on that? Okay, good question, though. That's a really good question. Um, and the, the, one of the hard things, too, as a buyer on that piece, too, is sometimes you had a club 
that that your category didn't sell very well, but you they gave you a lot of space. And so you were really having to be creative to get enough SKUs to be able to fill that club. Other times you had a club that was really good for your category and you had were given very little space. And so you were having to cut items maybe that did six or seven hundred dollars a week in that club. So good question. Good question. Um these are just some palette examples. You can see that it's easiest to make a good, nice looking palette with uh, with uh, box items, right? Because it's, it's really clean, they fit together well. Um, used to see a lot of really cool things uh, um, from Serial was kind of the first one that did the thing with the interlocking graphics. And you see that a lot now, but it's kind of nice just to go around the club and look at palettes that work, that, that are bright, they're, they're colorful, they work well, structural integrity, that you can shop them from three or four sides. But these are just some examples I thought of some palettes I thought looked pretty good. All right, packaging. Um, I've had it as a supplier, my time on the supplier side, I've had a lot of marketers um, push back on clubs saying, hey, we really, we don't like doing packaging for club because we can't do, we're marketing for club because we can't do shelf talkers and we can't do uh, static clings on the floor and we can't do all these things. But the really good thing to, to, to reinforce with your marketing teams is consider where else do you have a billboard of that size to sell your product? I mean, it's a, it's a billboard that's 48 or 40 inches wide by 52 inches, right? So look at that all as a billboard, a selling billboard. Um, one of the terms that was used a lot in club is the five by five rule. And that's really old. It's been around forever. But, and what it means is just that a, a member should be able to glance at a pallet and within five seconds from five feet away, understand what that product is, what it does and why they need it. Right. So you've got to be, you don't want to put too much on your packaging that, that is just not consumable, right? You can't, you can't process that much information quickly, but what are the impactful things that you could say that kind of help, feed into that five by five rule. Um, this is one that's been popular, uh, been a push by, from club for a few years is having UPCs on as many sides of that box or package as possible. That came from the, uh, mainly from Sam's club and it was because of scan and go. So if you think about uh, historically, items usually just had the UPC on the bottom. And if you are a member and you're shopping with Sam at uh, scan and go, and that uh, UPC code is on the bottom of a 52 pound bag of dog food. It is not really easy to, to turn that over and scan it. Or uh, think about a 32 pack of Coke, right? It's, if it's only on the bottom, it's really hard to flip that over and scan it. So what they're looking for to make that easier uh, for, for scan and go members is to have that UPC everywhere that you can get it. Um, the other piece of that is, is too, is there's a lot of phone enabled technology now for uh, associates working in the clubs, right? So they could scan your product and tell how many they've got on hand, how much is on order and things like that. And if they have to go flipping around a uh, product or looking underneath it, it makes it really hard. So you want that UPC as many times on that packaging as you can get it. Um, colors, bright or light colors usually work best in the club. I've ran into some situations, uh, even when I was with Mars uh, on the supplier side, is we designed a package that looked really good when you were sitting in a, a office environment, but when you took it in the club and put it under the steel, it looked too dark. So if there's one bit of advice there, it's if you are developing a package and you, you know, you've got it all in, uh, together and it looks good and stuff, take it into a club and actually slot it in where it's going to be selling and then evaluate how it looks. Savings claims. PG is really good at this, is making savings claims on their packaging. You can see an example there on a, well, there's that's Flonays, but save up to $49. The reason Club Channel really likes that, especially Sam's, is, um, is because you think, okay, I paid $50 for our membership. By buying this one item, I can save up to $49. Now, you have to get with your buyer who is going to put you in contact with the legal department. And you'll have to say, this is the claim we want to make. And the, here is how we arrived at this claim. But it's a really, it can be a really impactful thing. Um, the other thing, call to action. So limited time only. If you're doing a one-time buy in a club channel, sometimes it's good to put on your packaging, limited time only. 
uh, to kind of force people to, you know, to take action, not to wait till the next time they come back to the club. And then two, retailers, these retailers like it too, when you say things like available only at Costco, available only at, available only at Sam's or BJ's. So those are just some things packaging wise um, that are some good things to keep in mind. Any packaging questions? Okay. Quality was another one of the things that um, that was is, is kind of a non-negotiable. Club is looking for a mid-tier and above, right? I've seen a lot of items as a buyer that were presented to me that are good items in the market and sell really well, but their bread and butter is mass or their bread and butter is uh, value channel. They just don't hold up on a quality level the way they need to for club, right? Um, lately, there's been a lot more focus internally on by buyers on online reviews. And some of these club retailers have taken a stance to say, Hey, if it's not at least four stars, we're, we're going to discontinue it. So keep an eye on your online reviews. Make sure that they're kept up, you know, that, that you're, you're keeping an eye on that. One piece on quality, re, take the time to reinforce quality with your buyers. Uh, i give you an example. When I was buying laundry and cleaning, um, uh, SC Johnson showed, did, me, did a testing for me and showed me uh, – Windex, right, and how it was tested and why it was better than other uh, other glass cleaners. And, and you don't think about that necessarily with a big brand, especially like Windex. Hey, everybody knows Windex, but I didn't know why it was good or how it tested versus other things. So take the time. Don't assume your buyer knows what your quality level's like. Take the time to show them wherever you can. Now, sometimes that's a lot easier when you're a plant tour or you're in a, a testing lab environment with them. But anytime you can do that, that's always good. And it builds a lot of equity with your buyers to know that you've got really quality stuff. And ensure your packaging conveys quality as well. I've been shown a lot of items that the item itself was quality, but the packaging just didn't keep up with it, right? The packaging looked like it was, you know, from Dollar General. It, did, it, did, it just didn't look good. Um, so make sure that your packaging uh, conveys your quality message as well. All right, Matt. So productivity. Here's the difference between mass and grocery and club, right? If you go into a mass retailer, I guarantee you in any set, there's a lot of items there that are selling very little. They're not paying the rent. Um, in club, every item must be productive. It must pay the rent. You can't have sacred cows that you're having there for no reason. They Everything has to be productive. And as a buyer, the more years you're on a category, if you're a good buyer, um, you've been go gone through this sort of work and every year you're weeding out the bottom feeders. You're, you're weeding out the items that aren't hitting things from a productivity standpoint. So you get to a point that when you do your assortment work, that you don't have dead wood, right? So every item must pay the rent. Um, the main productivity measure that, that buyers look at is dollars per club per week. That is key. That is is really, really important. Um, hurdle rates. You, a lot of times you probably ask your buyer for a hurdle rate. Hey, what do we have to hit on this? And I always loved that question and I hated the question. And, and I'll tell you why I hated it because it's also, it's all, it's often a club by club benchmark. When you do your assortment work as a club buyer, you go club by club, item by item. And there are some clubs that $300 a week is a pretty good number and it's solid and you can keep that item in the club. There's other ones that the same $300 a week is probably the weakest item in, in that, in your category there, right? So even though a buyer may say, hey, about, about $400 a week is healthy for the subcategory, it doesn't necessarily mean on a club by club basis that that, that will hold true. Um, Club provides a massive volume opportunity, and and I've pulled some some average productivity for SKU, um, and th th this data showed that like Costco was like twelve hundred dollars a week is kind of average. Uh, Sam's was closer to five hundred a week, and BJ's like two thirty five. I've seen some different numbers on this, but it's safe to say that when you're talking to your organization about trying to gain club points of distribution. Reinforce with them how productive this this is, and these are to be your most productive uh, skews out in the market are the ones you have in club. Matt, do we have another question? Was that 
Who was that? We do. Yeah. Uh, our friend, Mike, uh, Mike, good to see a friend. Um, it says, do the productivity standards vary based on frozen versus chilled versus ambient on a by category basis, tire shop versus food? Abs absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, I know most buyers have got a number in their head for their category in general, uh, and it varies category to category, but it also varies at the subcategory level. So one of the categories I bought was commercial bakery. Well, you know, commercial bakery, the average bread item might have done $420 per week per club. The average bun item might have done $550. So you had a different benchmark. Sometimes you would bring items into the club somewhat to make a statement, right? Like uh, you think about a gluten-free bread. If you brought a gluten-free bread in the club, you knew it wasn't going to do the average 420, right? You just knew. But it couldn't be horrible. You might look at that and say, okay. I know this is kind of a fringe item and only appeals to certain people. I can live with 250 a week, even though I know that's going to be well below average. But it, but that's a good question. But it varies by category, by subcategory. So uh, availability in, in stocks. I was trying to put together an example to show you why in stocks are really really important in club. And so I looked at the dry to dog food assortment. I just picked a a subcategory just for fun. At Walmart, you had about 50 SKUs. In club, you've got about 12 or 13 SKUs. So say say that draw, dry dog food item is Purina uh, dog chow. Well, there's probably four sizes of dog chow at Walmart. I'm just guessing. Um, so if there's multiple sizes, if you're out of one of those sizes, well, they can buy another size. They may not like it, right? Or they may buy another dog food that's really similar. In club, in a lot of these subcategories you get into, you may only have one or two or three choices. And so, and, and so if you're out, they're out, right? There's nothing substitutable in many cases where in mass and grocery, there are a lot of things that are somewhat substitutable. So you really always got to prioritize your club availability. Over the last few years, especially through COVID, Availability was so bad that as we did our assortment work, what we started doing too was not only looking at productivity of the items we had, but what was their end stock rate. And we started deleting a lot of items, not because they weren't productive enough, but just because they weren't in stock enough, right? So that's become more and more important. So another another great question here it says, uh, does roadshow investments figure into the productivity analysis at Costco? Roadshow? It's a hard one to answer. I probably could answer a little, uh, a little more for Sam's than Costco because I haven't dealt with that at Costco. But at Sam's, that's considered like a category unto itself. Um, but I think not, usually on the road shows too, um, one of the things we looked at was was proving out a proposition via road show. Does that item deserve distribution in club every day? Um, but I, I'm not sure about how the productivity measure works on that. So wish I had a better answer for you. But I'm not sure on that one. And then support. I, uh, you know, I, I was just by, by chance, I was just on the phone with uh, a GMM from Costco this morning who I've got a good relationship with. So Mike, I will, I will ask him and I will get back to you later today. Good. That's good, Matt. Um, support. Right. So your buyer is going to come to you with a lot of objectives. And internally, what will happen is there'll be a big push for, say, uh, direct to home um, shipping support or demo support. What? And sometimes you're going to have to you're going to have to support items based on what the buyer is asking you for. But you've kind of got to balance that with what provides the greatest ROI. Um, make sure you're asking your buyer a lot of questions about available tactics and what kind of return they typically see from, from those tactics being done. Uh, it's always good to experiment, especially if you can experiment in ways that doesn't cost you a ton of money. Um, be, be proactive in supporting your items. I ran into a lot of situations as a buyer where a company would do almost nothing in support of their items until I said, hey, this item is very unproductive. I'm going to have to delete it. And then the support truck backed up, right? And sometimes by the time that happened, that decision was already made and it was too late to go back on it. So be, 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 be proactive about supporting your items. I've always said that if su suppliers were as keen on 
making the item the per, the the distribution they have more productive as they are get trying to get new distribution they'd probably be better off. So make sure you're supporting your existing distribution. Um, and clubs sometimes can be your greatest opportunity to market to your target consumers. There's a lot of things you can do now. You can target, uh, you know, you can target, do email blast out to uh, people that haven't bought your product in and say Sam's Club in the last six months or people that haven't bought the category in the last year or there it, with club, knowing the member, it, it helps you, market to the people you want to market to so and then there was just some examples on the next page of just some support tactics you can take everybody knows about demos uh, instant savings books mbms at costco um, uh, the mailer at bj's there's a lot of things you can do but uh, it's probably in within a half hour it's not uh, you probably don't have enough time to go into each one of those tactics so uh, a sort of process just to kind of tell you a little bit of how this works, and I used to go through this with my suppliers a lot, but it's a club by club process. Generally, you have your annual meetings with suppliers, and once they throw out all the new items they want, everything they want you to take into consideration, do distribution they want, you hold up with your category advisors, and it usually takes two to three months. Um, you're going club by club, item by item, to the point you almost have snow blindness. It, it, it can be kind of rough. Um, first thing you look at is how much space do you have in the club? And are you already over or, uh, over or, uh, or under skewed? What's the productivity of your current assortment? What are your in stock rates look like? How much space are you going to hold back for rotational items? And that depends by category, depends on the category. What are the demographics of the club? So you can help match those items up correctly and any kind of new item considerations. So um, just a little bit about retail, the club retailers. We've talked a lot about things that are pretty much consistent for all the club retailers. Most everything we've covered has been consistent across the big three. Um, but when you look at the different club retailers, these are just some bullet points that I see. Um, Sam's Club is going to bias toward broader ACV type items, brand items, whereas you know Costco and even BJ's can be a little more niche at times. Um, Sam's is really pushing hard on the technology front with things like Scan and Go. Their private brands have made a big shift. Um, the good thing as a supplier is you have a single buying location and you can sell everything at one spot. Uh, Costco can be a lot tougher. BJ's, you've got one place that buys for everything. Um, E-commerce has been a real priority to Sam's. The club bit, pickup business is very, uh, very well developed. Uh, they really haven't had much expansion of locations lately, but lately they, they came out and said that they are planning on starting building new clubs over the next few years. They're often co-located in parking lots with Walmart stores. Um, and that's been one of Sam's downfalls over the years is they've tried to get by on the cheap when it comes to real estate. And sometimes what they would do is co-locate co with a Walmart store for efficiency, but it might have been a good spot for a Walmart store, but not a good place for a Sam's Club. And it made it hard as a buyer because you have some Sam's Clubs that are really upscale neighborhoods and some that are not, um, made it tough. Uh, you're seeing less and less focus on business members than you've seen in the past, and, and they're working hard to try to elevate their assortment. Costco, highest income demographic. They pay premium for real estate. Um, regional buying offices can often be hard to navigate. Um, they're very trend forward. They got separate business centers. There's 23 of those now. And what that's allowed them to do is pull a lot of those business SKUs out of their basic, the regular Costco's and move them into these business centers. And it's freed up space for them to do more consumer banks in their regular Costco's. Um, they're really good on treasure hunt. They got top notch in private brands, uh, really good item merchants. Um, one of the things that their online presence has been a little bit less than uh, the less developed than Sam's. Um, because they've been un unwilling to sacrifice margin for online sales. Um, so there's something to keep in mind. BJ's is a bit of a hybrid, and, and I guess it makes sense to be a hybrid when you're going up against Sam's and Costco. Higher SKU count, they carry some grocery items. Um, their growth pattern hasn't been as good as what you've seen in Sam's and Costco. Really heavy focus on, on ancillary income and revenue. Um, they, they do a lot of promotions and they charge you pretty hot to do those promotions. Uh, but they do have some aggressive expansion plans. Any another questions? question. Yeah. yeah, another question here says, could you ever see Sam's replacing a closed Walmart store 
since the clubs seem to be managing shrink better? Placing a closed, I could, yeah, I could see that happen. I, I don't know the difference in the square footage. Most SAMs, I think, are uh, on average about 124, 128,000 square feet. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what that number is on, on Walmart, but yeah. Yeah, Matt, uh, I'm not sure on that one. Do you have anything to add on that one? You're saying replace the, the put a SAMs in a physical location that had been a Walmart? Yeah, so if a, if a store needed to be closed and, and Walmart yeah. is, you know, obviously announcing some locations that are closing because their inability to to control the that yeah. you know, shrink, would could you ever conceive of putting a Sam's Club in a space? And and to your point, you know, the square footage difference might be might be a little bit of a challenge, but um, I don't know. You never. It's not know. a bad idea. It's, it's not. It's actually a really good idea. Yeah. So, uh, these are just some statistics I pulled um, or I, I, I accessed there. And it just shows the sales of the three main players. And you can see there's a significant difference between Sam's, Costco, and BJ's there. Um, number of uh, members in the millions. Uh, Sam's doesn't provide that information, but you can see the Costco and BJ's number, the number of uh, clubs in the U.S. The one that I highlighted there that I think is really interesting is the sales per club. Costco is about 250 Sam's is like in the 120s, and BJ's is around 72. Um it used to be a few years ago that if a, if a Sam's Club got to $100 million, that was a big deal. Like that was something that was really celebrated, and that's become a lot more common now that, that we've got a lot of clubs over $100 million at sales. So but just some closing thoughts, right? We talked about those things that you have to do be, to be successful in club. And just every supplier has to observe those rules of the club to be successful, whether it's value, it's quality, it's you know having a club pack and good packaging. That's across the board. Um, a strong club strategy is essential. And that's something you need to have in your company that, that has some teeth to it, right? It is something that you can pull up as a file that shows what those rules are. That's something you can pull out of your desk drawer that says we're only going to sell the, these items to the club channel. Here's the pricing. Look at your slopes. Uh, but a club, a strong club strategy is successful. And I've seen a lot of situations where some retailer wanted a club pack and internally as a company we looked at it and said, oh, wow, that's an extra $200,000 in sales. If we can do this. Well, yeah, but you're putting 10 million at risk or you're putting 20 million at risk and it's just not worth it. Um, be thoughtful with your pack and cost architecture, right? Even if club's not participating in an initial launch of an item, make sure you're leaving space from your pack size and your cost structure to have a club pack at some point in the future. I see a lot of companies go to their point of absolute pain for Walmart in terms of pricing. And then at some point in the future, they think, oh yeah, I'd really like to have distribution in club too, but they've left themselves no wiggle room in terms of pricing to be able to get to a cost slope for club. Never take your club di distribution for granted. Always be working on it, looking at your productivity, doing the things you need to do to build that. And then recognize the difference in club competitors. Sometimes you can hit on an item that one size, one thing works for all three. And sometimes you're going to have to do something decidedly different for all three. Um, and opportunities don't come frequently in club because of the number of SKUs. Uh, Sam's Club or Walmart or Sam's Club or Costco or BJ's Buyer has to say no a lot more than they say yes. So those opportunities won't be frequent, but if you can hit on things, the wins can be huge. Mm -hmm.